Ladies and gentlemen, it's six o'clock in London, it's 1pm in New York in Eastern Time, 1am in Hong Kong, 3am in Sydney, 10am in San Francisco, and 10.30 at night in Mumbai. Greetings, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending where in the world you are today. My name is Patrick L. Young, the IPO Vid Livestream Series 15, episode number four. That leaves us at a season year ending, episode 088, and the show starts here. In tonight's show, it's another packed program after 40 guests across 36 shows to date this year. And we're now at number 37 of 2022 to round out the year with our second highlights package. A review of the year from our guests who provided insights and knowledge on topics such as the parish of exchanges, blockchain and cryptocurrency. Last week, I opened by mentioning the gradual normalization of life away from COVID and the remarkable plight of the NSE during 2022 with its many crises, albeit their management who are still in jail and won. SBF, when you wrote this note, last night, he was still at liberty. We thought that was an injustice. Well, the American authorities are listening, ladies and gentlemen. SBF has been arrested. And it looks as if the CFTC, the SEC, and many, many more are going to be throwing the book at him. More significantly of all, I think, in the long term, CFTC, read the minutiae of the indictment today. Page six, it says... Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Tether are all cryptocurrencies. Meanwhile, the crypto market is in a bit of turmoil. We've had $1.9 billion withdrawn from Binance overnight. That looks a bit worried. You want to understand what's going on in this whole crypto world as we look at Bitcarnage? You need to be reading Exchange Invest. ExchangeInvest.com, the daily newsletter of the Bourse business. It's going to be $299 per annum until December 31st. After that, new subscriptions, $349 per annum, ladies and gentlemen. And believe me, it's worth every single cent. So for our last final show of the year, let's pick out just a few key stories from 2022. Of course, first comes up that last one to break bit carnage. The, the crypto winter was being viewed as a light southern hemisphere affair by many of the bit folk earlier this year. Whereas now we're approaching Christmas and it's clear this winter is a winter which equates to a bad season in Siberia. And it's a long, long way from being over yet. The contagion risks are astounding right now after a series of three-letter acronym collisions, FTX, SBF, to the fore. And of course, that twisted relationship with Alameda Research, which went from gilded prop shop to busted flush in a few moments last month. Mainstream media not looking so good now. Look back, it's only actually almost exactly a month to the day since the New York Times was still trying with the New York Times to build a puff piece around that poor, innocent chap, Sam Bankman fried the man who is currently a fugitive arrested in the Bahamas, I hasten to note, and will soon, we hope, be sent to the United States of America via extradition to face the music. And serious music, we hope it is too. The ramifications of that whole bit carnage affair are going to continue well into 2023 and beyond, as will the aftermath of the nickel nightmare, which even caused LME's then outgoing CEO, Matt Chamberlain, to remain with the exchange. On the other hand, as Matt, of course, who was a, an excellent IPO bit of a a year or so ago, actually Matt might have dodged a bullet in that one because he was heading to a form of crypto enterprise. Perhaps that was better that he stayed at LME and not went to Komainu. For those seeking to recall the more exotic story from this year, what could better, of course, that holy hoax saga where former NSE CEO, currently in jail, Chitra Ramkrishna, sought advice from a mysterious Himalayan yogi, or so her emails appeared to suggest. Chitra was subsequently freed on bail one morning and promptly escorted to court to be remanded in custody immediately on phone tapping charges. 
Tragically, the war in Ukraine led to our colleagues and friends in Russia being cut off as a result of the rather psychopathic behaviour of the President of Russia, Mr. Putin. Moscow exchanges and SPYMEX amongst those markets that were dropped by pretty much the rest of the world, including all of the exchange-related groups, while Russia hit back by sanctioning, amongst others in our parish, leading exchange practitioners, Jeffrey Sprecher and Adina Friedman. Amusingly, the Russian list noted that Jeff Sprecher was sanctioned due to his being chairman of the New York Stock Exchange. That was actually a post he'd handed over to Sharon Bowen over a year ago, on December the 6th, 2021. Of course, finally, amongst all these key stories from 2022 come the disintermediation proclamations. FTX had kicked this all off in 2021 when a rather craven CFTC seemed to be quite willing to endorse their extremely bizarre concepts of CCP clearing. Sadly, the brilliance of redistribution that was Sam Bankman Freed's philosophical creed meant that his wealth was already actually non-existent before the CFTC had managed to vacillate their way to a decision on what would have been a hugely destructive systemic disaster for the central counterparty clearing house business. Thus, the devastation of CCP rules were avoided, but not thanks to any regulatory foresight we hasten to add. While in the world of direct brokerage, SBF unleashed a beast I had actually thought was likely to appear 20 or more years ago. The Chicago Mercantile Exchange CME Group, they delivered their proposal first for what amounts to a brokerage cum conflict of interest machine with the exchange group, and the FIA remained remarkably chilled, if not outright tacit, the FIA being, of course, the Teamsters Union of the Futures Brokers Community. Of course, true, it wasn't the first such proposal. Globex Markets, either CME in the UK, was de facto a brokerage arm of The CME also promised to direct the long established FCM dormant trading. Watch this space for more development. Yes, and its last call to subscribe at 299 more days, which comes in in an inflation adjustment on January the 1st. Onwards to today's highlight show, ladies and gentlemen, and I hope you're picking up everything live because I know we're suffering a little bit of an internet problem at the moment. We have been promised a technician would be here an hour and 20 minutes ago, but he hasn't quite made it yet. Sadly, let's begin by going back to a question from the last show, which we didn't have a chance to address. Hello, Anthony Clancy. Great to have had your support throughout the course of the last year. So... In terms of the UK regulation of crypto and digital assets, do you see this being regulated quicker in the UK than the US markets, and could it be achieved in 2023? Now, actually, Anthony, that is an absolutely cracking question to be asking me today, because indeed, the world is moving incredibly fast as we speak, because what we're seeing is an incredible explosion in regulation in the USA. Look at what was going on just a week ago. There seemed to be nothing much happening in the investigations into the Sam Bankman Freed affair. And suddenly we've got the CFTC and the SEC overnight both having charges, as well as federal investigators. What's going to happen out of that? I believe we're going to see some sort of regulation. What it's going to look like in the USA is going to be very interesting, though, because, of course, don't forget, the American House of Congress is going to change. In fact, Maxine Waters, who's going to be chairing a session this afternoon in US time, this evening in UK time, of her House committee, she has to give up her role as chairman because the switchover to the majority after the half terms, which is now the Republicans in the lower House of Congress, is going to take place. That may place a very different emphasis on what goes on. Equally, it looks to me as if we've got a very, very substantial and significant upheaval amongst the overall ethos of what's going to be regulation. So to take us back a step, where are we going to end up? Right. 
The European Union has a problem as of this week. Massive Qatari corruption scandal, which is leaving us in, well, chaos for them. At the same point in time, that probably means that anything to do with Mika may yet be pushed back because there is an unbelievable storm taking place. Already today, they've managed to vote out the vice president of the European Commission because she was found with something like 600,000 euros in a Harrods bag in cash in her apartment. As you do, I suppose, if you're an MEP. Europe, therefore, could have a problem in regulatory terms. The UK, on the other hand, well, it's going to be interesting to see what goes on. I think there's a worry in the UK because actually the UK has no meaningful government at the moment. They're going to be panicking through the course of next year. It'll be interesting to see what happens. So actually, the people who are back in the catbird seat, I think, for regulation is going to be the USA because they're going to start pushing very, very fast to make sure that the Sam Bankman fried fraud cannot take place again. And in that case, that is going to lead to a colossal problem for the related entities within that whole affair. So I hope, Anthony, that answers your question. Let's go to what's going to be today's show. We're going to start talking through a series of highlights videos. We're going to be dealing with a number of highlights that have come from the course of the year. We had 20 last week. We're going to have 20 this week. And who better to begin our show with this evening than talking to NASDAQ's Senior Managing Director of Global Listing Services, Erja Rexon. Well, personally, uh, I would see that, I would like to see that, I mean, this cross-border trading and listing listings are getting easier, not so complicated. So we have to get rid of these local rules and regulations regarding this and that, I mean, clearing and settlement and all that. So it's it's on my wish list. Interesting. Therefore, we come to this whole issue of cross-border trading and settlement, trying to make the listing rules easier. And actually, since Area was on the show earlier last year, we did see some progress in the what amounts to still being rather intangible capital markets union process, but certainly some degree of movement within the European Commission in recent weeks, which has hopefully improved the opportunity so that we can list more SMEs across Europe and get some entrepreneurial drive just when, let's face it, the European Union is on the skids. Now, that takes us neatly to our second video this evening. We had a delightful conversation. It was IPO Vid 61, Sonara, bringing trading solutions to life. And I was delighted to speak to a member of the Royal Borough of Kensington and Chelsea's Council, and also Sonara's Head of Sales and Marketing, Hamish Adurian. I think the move to cloud will, it's, it's been slow, but I think it's going to start accelerating. And there'll be more and more solutions that will be shifted uh, to the cloud. I think another interesting area is standards and standardization across the financial markets. And to what extent, again, technology can help deliver that. I mean, there's, there's so many things you think about, you know, codes, different account structures across the, across the industry, which can make interoperability incredibly difficult. So that's an interesting area to see how that can be resolved. But you know, that, that has its own it has its own challenges. But technology can help address all those areas. I think lastly, but certainly not re- least, mentioned resilience. I mean, that's an area of continued investment uh, where companies will need to look at how they can keep keep going essentially in, in times of high market volatility. And again, that that's not strictly just about making sure your systems can cope, but also that you have the right people and processes in place to support that. Absolutely fascinating insight. Standardization, one of the key things that I think we've been looking for. And also, of course, standardization of listings, as Aria was talking about when she was discussing from to infinity and beyond from First North just a moment ago. That was Hamish Adurian, the head of sales and marketing, a former coder himself at Sonara. Fabulous people building exchanges all around the world as we speak. Very, very interesting discussion there that we enjoyed in IPO Vid 61. And don't forget, ladies and gentlemen, you can catch all of these shows as back episodes on YouTube, LinkedIn, or Facebook, wherever you're watching this live show this evening. They are all there. Go search for IPO 
dash vid. And while you're at it, please give us a little bit of love. We would really, really welcome anything that you're going to do that gives us a comment or something else that helps those AI bots recognize the brilliance of this show and the entire team who put it together week in, week out with an amazing array of guests, 40 several this year alone. And we really, really appreciate a little bit of love, ladies and gentlemen, because that helps the AI bots know that people are engaging with the quality of our content. Speaking of quality of content, IPO78 just a few weeks ago was an opportunity for us to dive into South Africa, the incredible opportunities of the massive nation on the southern tip of the enormous opportunity, which is the African continent. A2X, a market for all, we had an opportunity to speak to their CEO, Kevin Brady. So look, I think I'm going to look at it through a South African lens, um, and I think it's probably more of a, an evolution than a revolution. But I think the challenge we've had in South Africa is actually we've largely had a, a shrinking market. Uh, and all, I mean, yes, market cap is up, but you know, if you look at um, uh, trade activity, they've generally been fairly constant, maybe tapering off. We've had delistings. Um, so I think the, what we're going to see in South Africa, and I think it's really going to be driven by, by competition um, and a response from the incumbent and possibly new competition, is that probably the first thing there's going to be a, a great, an ongoing great push to get South African regulation in line with international best standards. Um, you know, let's level the playing field. Let's level the playing field, bringing African standards up to the first world. Vitally important, particularly in a marketplace such as South Africa, which has traditionally been a huge driver of effectively capital markets, pretty much from the Sahara down. That was the fascinating CEO of A2X, Kevin Brady. Now let's move on. Talk about technology. Episode 81, we had a fantastic guest discussing delivering new parish tech. He's the COO of Torstone Technology and a board member of Yala Labs. Let's hear from Mac Gill. I haven't seen in my career such a convergence or a confluence of, of things coming together. You know, we have the regulatory move with, with T plus one, which as I said earlier, is massive. When we look at, at market participants having to provide crypto capabilities to their clients, that's something that is, is driving real change. When we look at the economic cycle, you know, that we just talked about and, and uh, the need for, you know, for cost and efficiencies over the next, over the next year, all these things coming together, to me, it just seems like this is, you know, there's been more change in certain, well, I think in the industry overall, but certainly in post-trade um, over over the next um, you know over the next couple of years than, than we've ever seen um, in in the last you know thirty. Wow. What a confluence of multiple different events all taking place, and particularly that emphasis on the back office. I think there is a stunning opportunity to manage to remake settlements and clearing. It doesn't have to be all about being blockchain, blockchain, blockchain. It's just about managing to come in and make those processes way more efficient for every kind of clearing and settlement. And indeed, of course, moves afoot to get us towards T plus one day clearing. I'm always fascinated when you ask them at the end of your interviews. I believe that we will see that the financial markets will follow somewhat the deglobalization we find on the political side today. And that was Christian Katz talking to us from Zurich about securitizing the future. 
what a fascinating and insightful show that was. And we move on to IPOVID 63, where we went to Canada. We were talking about the Canadian Securities Exchange moving from SMEs to Cannabis Power Player with their CEO, Richard Carlton. Well, I think that um, one of the things that I would like to see is uh, closer working relationships with some of our peer exchanges around the world. It would be great if we could facilitate, as I say, more direct uh, trading from the Germanosphere, uh, from South Asia, from Australia. There's so many barriers uh, at this point, not the least of which, of course, the time zone related. But uh, as I say, I would really like to see the base of potential direct investors uh, expanded quite dramatically through the use of uh, technology through uh, interconnection arrangements with local brokers to uh, international firms, as well, of course, the you know the the old clearing and settlement uh, uh, pipe uh, uh, pipe works uh, also has to be cleared up to reduce costs and to make it cost effective for people to be able to uh, to access that uh, those opportunities. Uh, we have a lot of interest uh, from from all of these places, and it can be a source of some frustration for the uh, uh, for investors and the companies. Uh, to be able to access that pool of liquidity that we know is there, uh, but we really still haven't managed to uh, reach yet. Again, isn't it interesting? We have similar themes re-emerging, the access to capital, the ability to raise money, all of the possibilities to do with the overall nexus of functions within a stock exchange, which Richard Carlton was discussing, whether you're a cannabis company in Canada, whether you're an SME, whatever you're doing when you're trying to list on his dynamic exchange. And actually talking about the dynamics of the exchange business, that brought us to a very interesting IPO bid number 67, where we discussed the whole topic of bourses as businesses, good or bad. And I was able to welcome a good friend of mine, the former Berlin Stock Exchange CEO, and a man who knows a huge amount about technology, because that's where he started his career, and equally an enormous amount about the business of bourses, because that's where he worked for many years, culminating as CEO of Berlin Börse before he retired. Börse Berlin's CEO, Arthur Fischer. Huh. You asked the right guy for that, you know, because um, I'm a conservative person and uh, I don't really trust technology too much. But I believe uh, the future of uh, capital market is very much connected to artificial intelligence. I think that uh, um, uh, AI will allow market participants to analyze uh, um, the data we have in, in a much more sophisticated way. And what used to be uh, HFT, high frequency trading, in a few years to come, uh, will be a combination of HFT and AI, whereby those models uh, at the end of the day will create, again, an advantage for the, the real uh, key players. Uh, I make an assumption that we already have some kind of pattern recognition out there. Um, I'm pretty sure that the regulator eventually will try to put a stop to that. Uh, but that's, that's sort of my two cents. I, I think uh, artificial intelligence in, 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 in trading will make a, a big change. I'm kind of negative when it comes to blockchain and uh, to a settlement. I don't really see a big advantage of a distributed ledger. Uh, our um, clearing systems work very efficiently and uh, I, I see actually no need. I could be wrong, yeah, but uh, I, I see no need for that. And uh, the blockchain is an interesting uh, uh, concept, but uh, we have a very efficient system in place already. So why would we throw that away to replace it with something which uh, uh, inherently uh, is more complicated and uh, doesn't give us a real advantage? What a very interesting position to discuss. Where does the capital market revolution go next? Arthur Fisher was looking at the idea of artificial intelligence. And again, interesting to hear that opinion. Maybe blockchain is not the answer to as many questions as people might have originally thought. And that was long, long, long before the crypto kitty self-immolated through FTX and other things. 
Let's move on talking about that question about where does the capital market revolution go next with our multiplicity of guests from throughout the course of this year and talk to James Falk. James was coming to us from Hong Kong. Delighted to say that today they've actually announced the final end of their lockdowns. He's the author of an incredible book, which you really need to read. One of the books of the year, Financial Cold War. Without any further ado, let's talk about Financial Cold War with James Falk. There's an extraordinary shift go going on in capital markets and it is going to affect trading and it's going to affect li liquidity in markets for, for a long time to come. First of all, the shift, uh, I think, led principally by NASDAQ to move from traditional exchange mainframe connectivity infrastructure into cloud-based infrastructure. Uh, I think we'll, we'll start to be able to bring many small markets which have not been prime beneficiaries of the, the growth in global liquidity over recent decades more into the center of the system because of the reduction in connectivity costs and the consequent ease with which global investors will be able to bring their liquidity to those markets. The innovations in, in post-trade I think are even more astounding because the, the advent of, of whatever you think about cryptocurrencies and, and so forth, the technology that underpins them is going to be transformational in markets in terms of the efficiency that that brings, not, not just in terms of reduced costs and, and more efficient processes, but in terms of the, the fungibility of liquidity across markets where, where previously that, that liquidity had been very, very siloed. And so uh, I think the markets, you know, not just because of the advent of, of China into the international system, but because of the, the shifts in technology that have accelerated and continue to accelerate in, in financial markets will, will lead to a, a massive transformation over the coming decade or two. And there we had a fascinating macro position talking to us from Hong Kong. The author of Financial Cold War, a must-read book of the year, was James Falk. Hello, Les Calvert. It's lovely to see you. Evening all. Sorry I'm late. Well, you can catch the first uh, 27 minutes on the repeat in due course, of course, Les, so you won't miss anything whatsoever because this show is instantly going to continue to be streamed as a recording on Facebook, LinkedIn and YouTube, wherever you're listening to this year's 2022 Exchange Invest in Review show. Thank you very much for checking in, Les. It's lovely to hear from you. And that brings us to our ninth excerpt of the evening, which was from IPO Vid 75, we were discussing developing your options. I think that's a phenomenal question, and I'm going to take a macro. I'm going to answer it in a, in a macro way. I think that there, it's there were at a time and place when the underpinnings of the post World War II were, uh, global order are changing and America is very much like Europe was, you know, during, as we were talking earlier, during the, uh, during the times that led up to the Congress of Vienna, instead of having these, these little like, you know, European uh, archdukes uh, quibbling with each other, we in the States have, uh, you know, various governors and Congress people. And I think what, what you're going to see happen now is that the world, which has built up into this sort of, in, uh, a, has become a global flow chart for capital might splinter perhaps. Um, and I think that you're going to find that that's going to create pockets of opportunity in different parts of the world in ways that we haven't really uh, anticipated. And if the regulatory framework for exchanges in particular can be stitched together with technology and through various treaties, just like we countries uh, parlay with other countries, I think you're going to see perhaps in the capital markets more of a globalization of focus. And people might want to own something in Shanghai, and they might want to own something here in New York or Australia or in Italy. And you're going to see a, a diminution 
over years of this home bias, because people have become so sophisticated over the past 20 years, thanks to technology and other, and other forces, that they're going to approach the markets differently. And some of these global exchange empires that have been built in, in the past 20 years are going to step in to fill the void. And that's, it won't happen tomorrow. It won't happen in a year, but I think that's what will happen in the next five to 10 years. Empires of capital, massive expansion in the world of exchanges. Remember, ladies and gentlemen, when I'm drawing it out, the Young's Pyramid of Exchanges, the one thing I'm always emphasizing is the mainstream media may talk about the fact that the capital market revolution has seen all of this power go up to the top, and certainly the major exchanges in tier one, the Hong Kong exchanges, the intercontinental exchanges, the CME, even the LSEG, have become much, much, much larger international powerhouses than they ever were before, as we can see from the semi-global footprints of people like NASDAQ and so on. But nonetheless, the growth power is in the bottom of that pyramid and there's a lot of growth of markets still to come because this is the world of exchanges in the digital age. Fabulous to hear those perspectives there from Stephen Sears as we were developing our options. And in fact, coming back to some of those opportunities and looking in the world of settlement once again, it was absolutely fabulous to have as a guest in IPO Vid 79, the president of global capital markets for computer share. We talked around the world from front office to back with Paul Kong. The rise of retail is, is here to stay. I think we, we touched on this earlier. Transparency of ownership chains, I think, has been a phenomenon that's been slow to fundamentally change, but it, it, it is gathering pace. And I think in the past, it's always been about, well, having more transparency means the people in the middle need to get out of the way. And I think what has happened in the last decade is the technology has actually moved to an extent where the intermediaries and agents that are in the chain can actually stay in the chain and data and information can pass through from issuers to investors and vice versa very, very effectively. So I think the technology will allow for greater transparency of who owns what. And the final point is, I just think you're going to hear a lot more about digitization just more, more, more generally. And I think it will you know, become more prevalent than discussion about blockchain and, and DLT. I'm not saying that blockchain and DLT won't have their role in securities markets. They they will. I think it will still take time. But digitization, I think, is going to become a, a term that people are going to continue to be talking about over the next two, five, um, ten years. And it's going to drive you know a, a lot more change, change in, in the marketplace and, and how people interact with the markets. One of the finest exports from the Antipodes to New York, alongside, I suppose, the likes of Rupert Murdoch. Paul Colm there discussing technology to allow for greater transparency. People will continue to talk about digitization over the next few years. It's going to drive a lot of change in the marketplace and how people interact with those markets. Once again, that theme coming through here, which we had in the last show, in other words, the first show of highlights of this year for 2022, discussing the rise of retail. And retail, I firmly believe, are here to stay as a hugely new, very, very strongly empowered group that we haven't seen the likes of it since probably the 1920s, a whole century ago, ladies and gentlemen. Now, talking about technology, that brings us elegantly to our next guest. He's the CEO and co-founder of a company called Clockwork.io. We were talking about accelerating the cloud with Stanford University professor Balaji Prabhakar. If there's a technological ability to do something, people will do it. And it is going to happen that way. And there is probably likely to be a, a speed race about all the time. But increasingly, when you get scale, you know, when you go to the cloud, and you have not just 300 people again with whom you're trading, in a, like, as happens, let's say, in a large colo facility these days, uh, that's probably even a larger number than colo facilities can, can handle. But uh, let's say you now have 3,000 or 30,000 people in the cloud that you're trading with. Then I think the whole game will shift to something more where it's more how clever are you at understanding data, how, how advanced are your ML and AI type algorithms. Uh, could you do things like limit order book reconstruction very cleverly and stuff like that. So this is sort of, that's one area I've seen some activity. The other one I like is also that smart contracts 
people have talked about them. For example, something that you could one could do right now, you know, traders look for the right price, and so they, they when when they place an order, they sometimes cancel it and revise their order to either make the price lower or higher, depending on whether they're selling or buying, and so on. Right. So these cancellations are required; otherwise, you may end up buying twice the amount that you wanted just because the previous wasn't cancelled. So uh, you could put a time limit on it. it because clocks are synchronized. You could think of smart contracts now as saying. I want to buy X, Y, Z, this price, and my offer is valid at no more than this price, let's say, and my offer is valid. Fascinating. The whole concept of moving all of this into the cloud, something which we were discussing, of course, in the first highlight show from 2022 with Guy Malamed, the CEO of Expert. And there we saw Professor Prabhakar giving us some very interesting in insights into how speed demonates so much of the equation, but at the same time, the possibility to deploy smart contracts and so on really could help drive the revolution forward. Speaking of technology, we had a wonderful show in IPOVid 53. Two diverse tech musketeers joined us for that show. Let's hear from the first of them, Elizabeth Philby of Elizabeth Philby Associates. I actually am really worried about the role of social media and influencers on um, investments um, and financial advice um, when it comes to young people. And so I really want good, verified education and information out there for young people when it comes to investments. And doesn't that become a fascinating pointer, a great insight into perhaps the whole year as it's been defined by the events of November and December? Verified education and information being required for young people when it comes to investments. Just think how useful that would have been at FTX. Well, for one thing, it would have helped people make the decision not to trust FTX with their money. On the second, more importantly, had Sam Bankman Fried actually had a financial education, it might have made him more capable of actually running the incredible empire which he built, which turned out to be, according to SEC documents and indictments filed today, a complete fraud from start to finish. Still on the topic of our two tech musketeers who joined us earlier this year, we had the founder of Streets Consulting Limited, she's the CEO there, and the host of the Diversity podcast series, Julia Streets. Well, actually, do you know, I was spending quite a lot of time, not masses of time, but uh, 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 more than I imagined I would, uh, looking at the metaverse. And mm. I think about... We've talked about uh, demographics. We've talked about a generation that is going to be empowered financially, but also that isn't being able to spend the way that we have spent in, the history, in, 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 in terms of recent history and is looking at ways to own investments in universes where actually nothing is physical. And if I look at the role of FT, uh, NT, um, uh, sorry, non-fungible tokens, NFTs, Look at digital assets, look at cryptocurrencies, look at um, metaverses where people have got basic avatars and people are now spending to dress avatars. People are investing in property in, in virtual communities that actually that's where I think capital markets will take us potentially in the future. What an interesting reflection on the whole nature of the metaphysical world in the metaverse, which was the topic of where she thought the capital market revolution was going to go next. Of course, talking about virtual property, dressing people virtually and so on, one can't help but come back to topic of the jour, SBF and FTX, who, of course, like all good old fashioned fraudsters, were still buying very much physical real estate. $316 million, it seems to be the total number at the moment, which amounts to something like 25% or so of the entire property market last year in New Providence, Nassau, alone in the Bahamas. 
fascinating to hear from those two excellent ladies, Eliza Philby and Julia Streets. Thanks to them for joining the show. And here we are. We're two thirds of the way through our show and we're moving back into the pure hardcore world of digital assets. We had the opportunity to discuss developing digital asset markets in IPO Vid 69 with SIX, that's a division of the Swiss exchange, of course, SIX's digital exchange head of equities, a former lifelong lifer too, Max Butty. Well, in the metaverse, that's where it's going. I think, and this is very personal, uh, I think that uh, the uh, metaverse uh, will develop uh, from what it is at the moment. A lot of people think that the metaverse is just for kids and gamers. Actually, it couldn't be f further from the truth. It's a physical, is a place out there that doesn't have physical properties, but nevertheless exists. It's a world. In that world, there are uh, people who, who operate and they're not so naive or uh, wrapped up into these virtual worlds to, to confuse them with the real world. They know exactly they are not uh, real. However, that they don't have physical properties. However, they don't see them uh, as less important than uh, the, uh, the real world. In, in the metaverse, you are, already have factories who make artifacts and goods that are consumed in the metaverse. Ideally, there could be an exchange that operates only in the metaverse and lists only companies that exist in the metaverse in the metaverse. There will be a need for capital markets in the, meca met in the meta world, uh, in, the, in the metaverse. So it's probably a far-fetched prediction, but this is, uh, this is where I think it's going. And it's going to be a lot more democratic. It's going to be a lot more fun as well. Uh, but uh, this is where I think it's going. A microphone. Maybe, and that's going to be the future and excitement of what's going to be happening in the outside world, according to Max Butty of Six. And of course, very interesting given the fact that he's dealing with a digital asset platform at Six Digital Exchange. But it reminds me, of course, of what happened. 20 years ago, well, 15 years ago, when we were looking at Second Life, which I think, if I remember correctly, had at least a dozen stock exchanges at one point in time, powering embryonic, indeed, online companies that were in the metaverse, doing metaverse businesses, through the metaverse with metaverse coinage long before anybody had ever thought of SBF, FTX, or indeed, it was only on the cusp of when Bitcoin itself was invented. Now, in episode 85 of IPO Vid, I was delighted to discuss evolving markets, evolving careers with the author of ESG, Investing for Dummies, and also the chairman of iPush Pool. He's a lecturer at the University of East London and formerly the head of innovation at the Deutsche Börse Group, Brendan Bradley. I would look at it from a kind of two pronged approach. One would be the product piece that we've been mentioning already. So I won't reiterate all of that, but there's plenty of product out there that um, you know, you've got the catalysts uh, that could be looked at, should be looked at, uh, and there's the ability to do that. Um, the other piece really then I think is the democratization of data. Um, yeah, and that may well be looking at exchanges and how much money they make out of data and who it is that produces that data in the first place. Uh, but what are the ways in which that data can be brought together, whether it's the golden source that I just mentioned for something like ESG, um, or whether it's the idea of um, really, you know, we've only scratched the surface on some of the machine learning that could potentially be utilized. Um, how could that be used? Um, you know, and I think that's kind of the two different areas of that capital market revolution. It will be driven on one side by product, uh, but on the other side by you know, where the technology goes. Uh, as we said, unfortunately, DLT perhaps won't be as prevalent there. But, yeah, who knows? If we look at the introduction of Web3 and the metaverse, um, maybe we don't have the imagination at this point in time to understand where that's going to drive a capital market revolution. And in five to ten years' time, we'll kind of go, aha. Uh -huh. So, yeah, that was what was going on. 
and um, we really should have seen that one coming. Quite an incredible multi-pronged approach, I would say, in so many things. And certainly interesting to hear the metaverse being mentioned again and where the capital market revolution goes next from Brendan Bradley. And also very, very significantly discussing machine learning, artificial intelligence, the whole use of data, because data has certainly been something that's been exploding over the course of the last few years and becomes a very, very interesting opportunity in itself for the future of markets. And looking at that, data as an ethereal position. Well, actually, let's move to our next speaker. I had the opportunity in IPO bid at 62, where PLY met, well, Patrick Young. Now, this Patrick Young is the City of New Orleans Director of Gun Violence Prevention. He's the author of A Way Up, Economic Development Post-Incarceration. It's a great book. I thoroughly recommend it. It's intended to be a way and a means for those who've been in jail to come out and become more financially business literate. Great book altogether. It was a joy to speak to my namesake earlier this year when Patrick L. Young met Patrick M. Young. First, it's been great to be here. I look forward to doing this again. Uh, there's a lot of stuff we can also talk about, and I'll be interested to get your opinion on. But the capital market revolution, I think, one, I think, honestly, I think it collapses. What I find in living in New Orleans, we, have, we deal with a lot of hurricanes. And so the weather really takes away your ability to have access to some power and some technology. So if we lose access to technology and power, then power is going to become the next revolution. So I believe that there's going to be a system of power banking where people are exchanging currency through power, whether it's needing, you know, to charge your lights or to charge your car as we get into electric cars, when we get into um, needing access to Wi-Fi. It is really important that we look at the system of power banking. And so I think the people that controls power in the same way that people control gas, it's going to be uh, serious. And so if we look at how gas prices are rising and how people are doing with gas, just imagine once we become fully dependent on electrical things. So I think the next revolution is how much power you have. It's going to determine how much wealth you have. What a fascinating concept. The whole notion of power banking, driving energy is the key to currency itself. That was the message from Patrick Young, the New Orleans Director of Prevention of Gun Violence and someone who I find thoroughly inspiring. Go and check out his video in its entirety from earlier this year, ladies and gentlemen. It was a terrific show. And I'm not just saying that because there's a man who's lucky enough to have the best name in the world. Moving on and back to, well, the nexus of banking, technology and finance, but without the power this time, it was a joy to chat to the founder of Pacemakers IO, one of the two authors of Reinventing Banking and Finance, and that was IPO Vid 84, Reinventing Banking with Alessandro Hatame. I think what will happen is the capital markets have been more digital than retail banking because of the nature of the business themselves. But at the same time, we're seeing some profound transformations in, in, in that sector. And what happens to the existing players, I think they need to realize that maybe the answer to um, adapting to the new, a new market does not lie with themselves. And they need to start looking around and saying, okay, who do I work with? Who do I engage with? Who do I partner with? Who do I acquire? to enable me to have those skills that I need to be able to be relevant in the, in the future. And uh, that is, I think, a fundamental skill. So I think the realization that I can't do everything in-house anymore. So 10, 20 years ago, a new proposition came. I just hired a few IT guys. I went to uh, some of the big firms and I hired them in. They came in, they designed the solution for me. That became my way of addressing that requirement. Today, the market is moving too fast. So I think companies need to be able to identify who they should be working with to be able to build that new capability and create an operating model that allows them to, to pick and choose the, 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 the specialty provider that they need and also be able to switch them out if they require a different skill set. 
That was a fascinating view on reinventing banking. Very interesting to hear about the nexus and how capital markets overall have performed better when we were chatting with Alex, Alessandro Hatami during the course of the year. He's certainly a man who's been very heavily involved in pushing forward the whole concept of digital banking from various different standpoints, including nowadays his own company. And that leads us, ladies and gentlemen, to our last guest of this evening. It was absolutely a joy to go into the offices of the Intercontinental Exchange, their European headquarters in the heart of the city of London, earlier this year and chat to a good old friend of mine. Nowadays, she's been elevated, even further elevated than she was when we chatted to her. That's, of course, a theme when you're on IPO vid. Look at Lynn Martin. Only a couple of years ago, she was appearing as the head of data. Now she's the president of the New York Stock Exchange. And what a brilliant job she's doing, too. So we had the opportunity to meet the ICE VP of Financial Derivatives, someone I've known for over 20 years. And it was a joy to discuss Coming of Age with ICE and Katerina Karamashi. I think it's really on the index, on the index space, right? Um, you know, it's, it's very much a space which is currently traded heavily in the OTC market in swaps format. I think mm -hmm. with all the change in regulations that is coming, uh, which is making the OTC market more expensive to trade versus on exchange, I think we will. There is, there is a bigger pie to go after in this OTC market to bring it on exchange, mm -hmm. and that will benefit everybody. It'll yes. benefit transparency. It's going to benefit the clients because when you bring stuff on exchange, it becomes commercialized. It should reduce the costs, and it benefits us at the end of the day. There's a bigger pie to go after, ladies and gentlemen. What a brilliant message to bring forward in what has been an incredible year for the established exchange parish. May not have been so good around the fringes of crypto, but then again, that's because they were running casinos, not exchanges, to put it mildly. What we have seen, ladies and gentlemen, through the course of this whole year has been an incredible number of fascinating guests who've given up their time to devote to some great educational input throughout the course of the year. 40-something guests over the course of 40 several shows, we've had the opportunity to talk about all aspects of capital markets, the capital market revolution, where they go. We look forward to seeing you in the new year with what's going to be our next round of shows. But what I want to think about was, well, we had one final little segment which I thought might serve as a useful way to give us a final video for today. We're looking forward to continuing the incredible derivatives, options, revolution the world over with ICE and the other great exchanges on the world, because this, ladies and gentlemen, is the world of exchanges. And in many respects, I can end this by saying, this is your life. <laughs> And of course, ladies and gentlemen, what did we have this year? We had the 40th anniversary of the Life Exchange itself, the London International Financial Futures Exchange, where I was honoured to work amongst several thousand great people during the course of the epic years of that floor. It was ultimately an incredible experience throughout what was going on. Nowadays, of course, markets are digital. Markets are all about well, in many respects, the electronic interface, but there's a huge physical component still to come. And that's why I'm really looking forward to our first show of the new year. We're going to be back on January the 10th with a fabulous guest, Simon O'Brien, who is one of the directors of the Abu Dhabi Global Market. We're going to be talking about building an island of excellence in the United Arab Emirates. And ladies and gentlemen, it only remains for me, Patrick Young, to say thank you very much for being part of this 2022 part two of the year in review show. I really want to thank all of the people who've engaged with us during the course of this year. Thank you very, very much in particular. Les Calvert for being with us today. It's absolutely delightful to see you. Thanks so much for your participation. Thanks to we had a fantastic question earlier on, which I hope we did justice to from Anthony Clancy. To all the people who've engaged with this show all year long, my thanks to you. Give us a like, subscribe to Exchange Invest. We're going to see you in the new year. And thank you very, very much to our terrific production team this evening, working with a slightly erratic internet connection. Thank you to Jamil, to Natalie, 
too racy and too bahata. My name is Patrick L. Young. I wish you all a fabulous festive season, a very happy Christmas. Whether you're coming in blockchain, life or markets, I hope it's a good one. We'll see you in the new year. My name is Patrick L. Young. Goodbye.